Hi there, this is Simon St. Laurent, and this is the first of my excursions on Rails screencasts uh, in support of learning Rails. Um, one of the most painful things about Rails is frequently just getting it installed, so I'm going to do a series of uh, installation demonstrations. Uh, for the first one, I'm going to start with a really stripped down server, uh, the Ubuntu server, uh, which basically, well, I installed it so it doesn't have anything beyond the core. Uh, the core Ubuntu server stuff on it. Um, that means, among other things, that if we go to look for Ruby with ruby-v, we're going to get not a whole lot. We're going to get a message that we can install Ruby. So we'll go ahead and we'll start by installing Ruby. Uh, I'm using apt-get. You can use aptitude if you prefer. Um, but it's pretty simple so far. It's going to go we'll look for Ruby. It's going to say uh, some suggestions that I'm not going to worry about quite yet. Um, one thing to note, we're installing Ruby 1.8, not 1.9. 1.9 is newer, but Rails is basically running on 1.8 at this point. So, um, it's a pretty typical Ubuntu install. Uh, if you want to do the same thing on Debian, you'll get something pretty similar. Um, one thing that's missing uh, we did install Ruby, but if you want the Ruby command line IRB, you won't get it. So we're going to install um, IRB because that's something that we'll want in fairly short order. Um, there are a few other packages that are definitely worth uh, installing. Um, Another one that we're going to install before going any further is RDoc, which is for Ruby documentation. If you don't install RDoc, you'll get some fairly strange uh, error messages as you try to install other packages, and it's just easier to install RDoc from the outset. Um, I think at this point we'll actually try to install something uh, on Ruby, we'll start by uh, installing gems. So the first thing we're going to install that will actually use Ruby is uh, the gem install uh, manager. Uh, gem is kind of a package manager like apt-get, and you can use apt-get to install uh, gem if you'd like to, but uh, that'll install an older version, uh, 0 0.9.4. And it seems a little strange to use a package manager to install a package manager, especially when that package manager can uh, change its own, uh, can update itself, which will create new complications for the other package manager. So to avoid that, we're just going to go to RubyForge, uh, and we're going to grab RubyGems, which is the uh, package for the gem uh, system. It's RubyGems here in the list. Lots of things use RubyGems, but just look for the RubyGems uh, group. We'll download version 1.2.0, and here you can see the tar archive. I'm just going to put that up here so that I can see it. And I'm not actually going to download it in the browser. I'm going to download it in the uh, at the, the uh, server's command line. So to do that I'm going to use the wget command and it's http rubyforge.org frs I don't really need to read this but anyway I uh, will hope that I type it correctly. And there we go. And it's grabbing it. And if we look, we now have a tarred up file, which we're going to extract. And OK, it all went through. Uh, change directories to rubygems 1.2.0. Take a look around. And what we need to do here is run that uh, setup.rb file. And for that, like the apt-get stuff, we're going to want super user privileges. So we're going to use sudo ruby setup.rb and see what happens. I need to learn to type, apparently. And 
it's installing and these things always seem to pause when they hit the documentation install it just takes time um, we'll see what happens uh, one thing to note it's installing gems for 1.8 um, if you are on Ubuntu and you install gems, it'll separate 1.8 and 1.9. The same thing happens if you're using apt-get. Um, and it looks like everything went smoothly. It's in the user, binder, user bin directory. We type gem, we don't get it. However, this is just kind of a fun trick. If you type gem 1.8, it's all there. So if you want to just create it so that it uses gem instead of gem 1.8, uh, we'll just go visit the user bin directory. Uh, we'll check to see what gems there are. It's just gem 1.8. So we'll create a, uh, an alias, a symbolic link. Actually, we need to be a super user to do this. And I got it backwards, of course. It's target first, then the name of the new thing, ls. And there we go. So now if we type gem, we get the same thing that we get as if we type gem 1.8. And that will make all of your documentation make a lot more sense. There's another key piece that we're going to need to install if we're going to build anything in Rails, and that's a database. Uh, just to get started, we're going to work with SQLite. Uh, that'll be actually SQLite 3. So we'll do sudo apt-get install SQLite 3. In addition to SQLite itself, we're going to want to make sure that we have a library of uh, code that will let us actually get into SQLite from, uh, from Ruby. Uh, so we'll do a sudo apt-get install. It's called libsqlite3ruby. And it's looking for it. It's getting it. And that'll take care of it. So we'll install that. So we now have access. This will mean that our uh, rake tasks can get into SQLite and that our Rails programs can get into SQLite. Now you will find documentation that talks about using gems to install the SQLite Ruby libraries. Um, that works fine in some environments. Unfortunately, in the Ubuntu server, it led me into kind of an endless uh, trying to track down why certain things wouldn't connect. So it was easier in this case to use apt-get than to use gem install. However, it's now time to install Rails, or at least try to install Rails. So we'll return to gem install and we'll do a sudo gem install Rails. It's really that simple. Well, sometimes. So gem starts looking around, visiting its repositories, getting the Rails stuff. Uh, recent versions of, uh, of GEM will include all of the dependencies, so you don't have to worry about that any longer. Uh, if you see older instructions, a lot of them have a dash dash include in dependencies. Um, it's just not necessary at this point. Um, as always, installing the documentation seems to take a long time, whereas installing the actual code doesn't take very long. Uh, it's worth pausing for a moment to see what you're actually installing. At the bottom there is the Rails 2.1 gem. Um, soon to be 2.2, but for now it's 2.1. Um, it includes a bunch of pieces which you actually could use separately. So there's rake, there's active support, there's active record, action pack, action mailer, and active resource. Um, rake and active resource get a fair amount of use outside of Rails. Um, the others tend to be used, at least in my experience, mostly with Rails, um, and we're just waiting for the documentation to install. Okay, that's enough waiting. I'm going to cut ahead. Okay, um, after a long wait, we've got all of the documentation installed and we're ready to go. You're thinking, that was easy. Why do I even need a screencast or a book? Well, uh, you'll see in a minute. First, we'll head back to our home directory. Um, and let's create 
a test application. Nothing very exciting. We'll just do Rails test. It generated all of these files. Everything should be going beautifully. Um, we need something in our application uh, just to give us a moment of fun. Um, so I'll go ahead and put in an example from chapter 5, which, whoops, we actually need to change to the test directory first. And uh, so Ruby script generate scaffold. And we'll do person, which has a name of string. Very exciting, right? Yes, very exciting. Everything explodes. Um, we're missing some parts. So to install these things, we're going to have to install, to make any of this stuff work, we're going to have to install OpenSSL. Um, we'll see if we can get it all in one big pile by installing the Ruby library for SSL. And hopefully it will depend on OpenSSL and install it. But if we're not lucky, then, you know, then it won't work. So, yeah, we should probably install OpenSSL first. So, we'll do that again. We'll do OpenSSL. So apparently, you can install the Ruby library without actually having it, but that makes me nervous. Okay, it's all there now. Let's do OpenSSL Ruby. Get this going. Yes, this time we do want to install it. Again, it's all for 1.8, but that's perfectly fine. Now let's try creating that person again. Voila, everything works. So we're in business, right? Um, let's see if Rails actually functions. So we'll do Ruby script server. It's booting up WebRick. We'll try installing Mongrel in just a minute. Um, and the server started. We have a small problem, of course. We're in a console, and uh, port 3000 will be great to get to once we can get to it. Um, but for now, we'll just shift to a different console. We'll say the same user. And we need a web browser. Uh, we use the really simple uh, text-based Links server, which I highly recommend to everybody who might be working from a console. And we have to install it, of course. So, unpacking links, setting up links, links is on the prowl. So, now we can do it. We'll give it our address. And yes, it was person, but for purposes of testing, it's people. This is part of how Rails does pluralization. Got a server error. Oh no, what do we do? Yes, we'll always take cookies from localhost. That would be nice. Okay, what we did here, of course, is the classic mistake in Rails of running the program, because you get all excited, um, without actually uh, building the database. So you can see here Active Record exploded. Um, not so unusual. So we'll switch back to here to our where we started the thing and we'll just run rake db migrate. Now we'll find out if our SQLite connections work. And they do. So we can get the server going again. So if we go back to links we can reload and suddenly we have an application. Okay, links doesn't display it in the most beautiful way, but we can actually do something. New person, we can enter a name. Um, this is a test. Create. And sure enough, we have an application running with a name. This is a test. So, we'll quit links. And at this point, we've got Rails up and running. You can do a lot more than just this test application. Um, with SQLite running, you should be able to build uh, applications that use databases. And uh, you know, we'll use this as a foundation for further work, further screencasts on more exciting kinds of deployment.